she found her husband shot in their own bed. The back door was open. The gun cabinet was open. I was basically freaking out. Police thought the mother of three knew more than she let on. Something ain't right here, man. I'm telling you. Detectives couldn't break her. They tried to trick her. I couldn't get on the telephone fast enough. I said, start the camera and get out of there. Did she really kill her husband? Or were police setting her up? The former beauty queen was used to being judged, but never like this. This is not what I was expecting. It was a circus, the whole thing. There are always two sides to every story. Tonight, we're on the case in Robinson, Texas, a small town right outside of Waco. Just before dawn on November 9th, 2005, a call came in to the Robinson, Texas Police Department. Robinson 911, what's your emergency? I got up this morning, I was in my front room because they didn't sleep. My back door was open, my husband's guns are all gone, and um, there's um, blood on the bed. He is doing uh, phone stuff out of his mouth. The caller was Darlene Gentry, a 31-year-old former beauty queen. Darlene and her husband Keith had been together ever since they were college sweethearts. We would just always go out, we would be dancing and things like that. You know, we just were always together. You know, he was always laughing and just having fun together and that was what was important. The young couple had bought a home and started a family. They had three young boys. Working and raising their family together. Darlene says the boys meant everything to Keith. I could tell the light of his life and they were the light of mine. They're a, a good combination of both of us. So you could see his personality in them and also in mine. So they were our life. Darlene Gentry agreed to sit down with us to discuss what would become one of the most sensational crimes in Texas. On that night in 2005, Darlene said her baby was sick, so she slept in his room instead of her own. When she went to wake her husband up in the morning, she heard a noise. I had realized the back door was open because you could feel the breeze coming through. And so I'd gone through just to shut it, and that's when I noticed things weren't right. You know, the, the gun cabinet was open. Feeling scared and vulnerable, Darlene says she called out for her husband. There was no answer. I go, still again, hollering at him to get up, you know, that somebody had been in the house. I get over there, and that's when I realize the noise is actually coming from him. As she got closer, Darlene says she saw blood on the bed. Keith was making a strange noise, and pink foam, she says, was coming out of his mouth. Darlene says she had no idea what had happened, but the sense of danger was overwhelming. She started to panic. Honestly, I don't know if I just went into a state of shock. I guess you could say I was basically freaking out. I just was focused on the boys, get out of the room, get out of the room. It was just after 6 a.m., about an hour before sunrise, when Darlene called 911. I got a uh, page from the uh, police dispatch of a home invasion robbery and the homeowner possibly was shot. Police rushed to the Gentry home. With their dashboard cameras rolling, the first officers arrived at the scene. Knowing it was a possible shooting, police were already on high alert. And then they spotted something on the lawn. Got guns on the ground right here. There were weapons found stacked in the front yard of the residence. And with the entire Gentry family and possibly a gunman still inside, the officers prepared for anything. Stand right here and just keep scanning. Don't let anybody near them guns. As one policeman stood guard over the guns, other officers went inside the house. It was a pressure-packed moment. Officers had to search for an intruder and get Darlene and her boys to safety. 
and it all had to happen as quickly as possible. The house had to be secured before paramedics could be allowed in to treat Keith. After going through every room, it became clear if someone had been there, they were now gone. Do you have any idea who this could have been? I have no idea. Okay, do you know which way they went? No, I saw nothing. Once the house was cleared, police turned their attention to Keith Gentry. He had been shot one time in the head. He was still alive, but barely hanging on. This guy's bad shape. He got a hole in the head. Keith's parents, Wayman and Glenda Gentry, lived right next door. And they immediately ran over but police wouldn't let them come into the house. And I asked them what was going on. They told me, you stay in your yard. Don't come over here. I said, well, what's going on? You know, it's my son over there. My daughter and all and grandkids. You stay over in your yard. Don't come over here. The gentry say police wouldn't tell them anything. Wouldn't tell us. We saw him when they put him in the ambulance outside. It was a heartbreaking moment. Wayman and Glenda felt helpless. All they could do was watch from a distance as the ambulance pulled away and took their son to the hospital. As doctors tried desperately to save Keith's life, police were back at his house trying to get information from their only possible witness, Darlene Gentry. The circumstances were starting to overwhelm the mother of three. It was like a circus. I mean, it was just so much happening. And we're talking, you know, children that from 5 to 19 months at this time. So they're scared, not knowing what's going on. They finally let Glenda come over and get them. Once inside the house, Glenda took care of the children and pressed a detective for information about her son, Keith. I says, what is wrong with Keith? And he said, he's been shot in the back of the head. I said, is he alive? And he said... He's breathing. He was breathing when he left here. That's what he said. And I said, okay. So I went in and got the boys. Well, as long as he was alive, there was hope. I kept telling myself, I have to realize he's not going to be the same Keith, but he'll make it. Detectives made a sweep of the house. They quickly realized there were no signs of forced entry. And the gun cabinet looked like it had been opened with a key. Nothing was missing. The weapons were the only thing that had been tampered with, and they were stacked in the front yard. But Darlene had told them the back door was open when she woke up. And with the guns missing from the cabinet, she thought there had been an intruder in her house. Investigators were getting suspicious. They had a lot of questions about the shooting of Keith Gentry. Something stinks about this, Gary. Something ain't right here, man, I'm telling you. While crime scene investigators began a top-to-bottom search of the Gentry home, detectives asked Darlene to come downtown and answer some questions. All she said she wanted was to be with her husband in the hospital, but she agreed to go. I got a consent to search from her and asked her to come back to the police department so I can get a more in-depth feel of what was going on. Darlene told detectives she would help in any way she could. She let detectives take her fingerprints and a sample of her DNA. She also agreed to have her interview recorded. We got back to the police department. I set up a tripod camera system to interview her. Just hours after her husband had been shot, Darlene sat down with Lieutenant O'Connor and once again went through the events of that morning. With a camera rolling, he asked her about what she heard and didn't hear, considering that Darlene said she had been sleeping in her children's bedroom at the time of the shooting. I really appreciate your patience with me on this, Darlene, but I'm trying to figure out, you can hear the kids, but there had to have been a gunshot that went off inside that house, and gunshots are loud. I, and that's what the... Um, I keep trying to physically wrap my brain about the only, I mean, I had the door closed to our bed, the kids' bedroom, but our bedroom, we always keep it open. Darlene said she did wake up around 5.15, but turned over and went back to sleep. Something had to have woken me up. 
I heard the dogs barking after I woke up, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, the dogs did something right outside the window. I don't know if it was my internal clock saying, you better wake up because you're going to be late for work, or I physically heard something. I don't know. That is something that I replay in my mind all the time, trying to think of what it actually it was, what it sounded like, things like that, because I don't know. Police went through her story. She thought there was a funny noise coming from her husband's bedroom, and she felt a cold breeze coming from that end of the residence, and she found that side door of the house open and on the way back into her husband's room uh, she noticed the gun case was open and all the guns were missing and uh, that's when she found her husband in their bed injured the way he was not knowing what actually happened is hard because everybody looks at you okay well you were in the house shouldn't you have known something well you no one can explain what actually happened except the people that were actually in that room. Darlene says she was still focused on getting to the hospital, but she was told that as the only possible witness, it was important to get all the facts. When an officer tells you to do something, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what I did. A little while later, the hospital called and told police to get Darlene there right away. Keith Gentry was now brain dead. The whole reason why the hospital had basically made the officers take me up there is because they were wanting us to consent to do uh, organ transplant. At the hospital, Darlene and Keith's family made the painful decision to take him off life support and donate his organs. He was somebody that I loved, I produced children with, there's that that bond that you lose and so part of me still feels almost numb I don't care who you are I think half of you dies when the child dies as the gentries tried to absorb the shock of the news they were left wondering who could have done this to Keith and why I was praying that I didn't know the person that did it that's all I was praying that I did not know the case was now a murder investigation. Back at the Gentry home, investigators were starting to find evidence. In the bottom of the house trash was a latex glove that had been rolled down as if to remove the glove, and inside was a spent 22 cartridge. The detective called me while we were at the hospital, told me he found a shell casing in a, the trash can and asked me what size bullet may have caused uh, the victim's injuries. So I visited with the ER doctor and he says it's going to be a small caliber, possibly a 22. Keith's father told detectives he had given his son a 22 caliber revolver as a gift a few years back. All the other guns that had been in the gun cabinet were placed out in the yard except for the 22 pistol. Investigators believe that was the murder weapon. Police searched the entire house for the gun, but had no luck. We did look in all the uh, air vents. Uh, there was a well outside the house that we obtained a, a large magnet to see if we could find the gun down in there with the magnet, and we did not find the gun at all. Investigators were left with a lot of questions and not many answers. They once again turned to their only witness, Darlene Gentry. Darlene was an emotional mess. She had just lost her husband, the father of her three children. But despite that, she agreed to go back to the police station and answer more questions. You can't think of anyone that would do any harm to you or Keith? No, I'm telling you. Darlene said Keith was well-liked by everyone, but someone clearly wanted him dead, and investigators needed to find out why. Soon, the questions began to focus on Darlene and her marriage. I mean, marriage was good, except for the arguing of the money. Yeah, and every married couple argues about money. It wasn't anything different. He had no girlfriends, I had no boyfriends. I mean, we were fine on that. Darlene says she and Keith had a pretty happy marriage. No one has a perfect marriage because 
If I said that, I mean, I would be lying because we would argue about little things here and there. Could an argument over a little thing become a motive for murder? It didn't seem likely. But as police went over her story, they found out something that raised a huge red flag. Darlene. Like currently in a traumatic type of event, but with her training and experience, you would think that she would step in there and help, especially a husband. Darlene admits she did nothing to help Keith, but says it's only because she was thinking about her kids. The amount of blood and everything else, that's my instinct went to my children because I didn't, I honestly, I can't tell you why I didn't do more other than just focus on them, but it was just, I don't know, I, mother instinct kicked in over the nurse instinct. Investigators were zeroing in on Darlene, and she began to feel the heat. The more they asked her about her marriage, the more she began asking questions of her own. I mean, are we looking to the point that I'm going to have to get an attorney or something? I mean, this is... I, I haven't done anything. I love my husband. And I would have never done anything to take him away from his boys, ever. As Lieutenant O'Connor continued to press her, Darlene began to break down. I've tried to be straightforward and honest with everything that I'm telling y'all. And what I don't know, I'm telling you, I don't know. I just, I've never been in a situation like this, and I'm just starting to get extremely nervous just because I've gone over this, even with you, five different times, and it's just... And I know that it's your job. I know it is, but I'm not... I'm sorry. I'm just... Finally, realizing she was a possible murder suspect, Darlene asked for an attorney. I'm just afraid that I'm going to get... You know, I'm trying to tell y'all exactly what well, I remember, and as I said, it's been a long day, sure. and I'm, I'm just... I, I don't want something, me trying to tell y'all something, to turn around and it come out not exactly what I meant and basically bite me in the butt. Basically, it's what I don't want to happen. The lawyer called me and said, what are you still doing there? And I'm like, answering questions. You know, I, I just answered and I, uh, truthfully, and he was like, get out of there. You don't have to be there. The entire time Darlene was at police headquarters, Investigators were at her house searching for clues. When Darlene ended the interrogation, she also told police to leave her house and stay away unless they had a search warrant. He said to tell everybody to clear out, that way we can start fresh. Okay, I'll get them to stop right now. They terminate the search. She just called an attorney. He wants us to clear out. But as they cleared out of her house, investigators took with them the glove and the shell casing they had found in the trash. It wasn't trash anymore. Now it was evidence in a murder investigation. Darlene Gentry was desperate. Her husband was dead, and a detective had just put her through a grueling interrogation, even accusing her of playing games with the truth during questioning. I told him, hold up, you know, this is not a game. This is, you know, our lives that we're talking about. This isn't something that, you know, we're just playing around with like he was implying. So I knew that I hadn't done this, so I wasn't afraid. To Keith's parents, Darlene was family. It was impossible to think she could have had anything to do with their son's murder. She had just always been so good. And we take our son-in-laws and daughter-in-law into us like our children. From the moment they met Darlene, they thought she was the perfect match for their son. They still have fond memories of Darlene and Keith's early years together. The fun they seemed to have, laughing and joking. and Darlene's just, pretty small. Yeah. They just made a good-looking couple. We loved her to death. Yeah. The whole family did. But the Gentries could see that Darlene and Keith's marriage started to sour after the birth of their third child. 
You just knew they was angry at each other if they was both really quiet. I mean, you could feel the tension. As police dug deeper, they learned the couple was having financial problems. It appeared that maybe uh, Darlene had been spending the, the money, the family money, on other things other than paying bills. And he said, you know, I had uh, two credit card companies call me at work today. He said, we were past due. He said, I don't have no credit cards. And then I said, well, I think your mother got a call to her today. And the last thing he told me, I said, Keith, you got some problems, you know, we can help you get out of it, it's not a problem. He said, no, you run my credit, you've killed me. Wayman and Glenda told investigators that Keith had confronted Darlene about it the night before he was killed. Darlene says they did have an argument, but they were able to work through it. We actually sat down and had a, probably the most civil conversation about all of this than we probably had in our entire marriage and talking about doing different things of you know consolidating that with the house loan and things like that and getting rid of all of that Darlene says it was just a conversation about finances between a husband and a wife but to investigators it was another red flag and then they came across something else that sparked their interest Keith had two life insurance policies valued at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's a substantial large amount of money and, and that's a pretty good motivating factor for certain individuals to commit murder Darlene says she knew all about the insurance policies and that she would never have hurt her husband for money that's their perception no one's life is worth money I mean that, that's just plain and simple he was my husband, father of my kids, and money did not mean anything compared to our children and our marriage. But police were still suspicious of Darlene, and the evidence didn't seem to support her theory that an intruder had been in the house that morning. Investigators found fingerprints on the gun cabinet and one of the weapons left on the lawn. But they didn't belong to any intruder. They were Darlene's. Of course my stuff is going to be everywhere. I lived there. I dealt with, you know, cleaning everything. He'd leave stuff laying around all the time. I have to pick it up, and I'm the one that, you know, is putting things up. But police were also interested in getting DNA test results on the latex glove found inside the house. When the results did come back, they showed Keith's blood on the outside and Darlene's DNA on the inside. They were able to link some DNA from the glove to Miss Gentry, so those gloves is something that she had handled or, or had worn. Police were now convinced Darlene Gentry had murdered her husband and set it up to look like a break-in. But Darlene says her DNA on the latex glove proves nothing. Well. To have my DNA on the gloves was very logical because I would have brought them home for my work. Keith been having blood sugar issues and I know that we had used them for that. I mean, there's explanations out the wazoo why it would have my DNA on it. Darlene says those shell casings actually support her innocence. Why would she get rid of a gun and yet leave behind a critical piece of evidence? Why would I be dumb enough if I was going to do something like this, to leave that piece of evidence, but be smart enough to get rid of the weapon. I mean, it makes no sense. But it all made perfect sense to police. Three weeks after Keith Gentry was murdered, they issued a warrant for Darlene Gentry's arrest. It was just an accumulation of things, uh, strictly circumstantial, but still enough for us to, to obtain a warrant. Because the case against Darlene Gentry was circumstantial, prosecutors knew they were going to have a hard time proving she killed her husband. We felt like it was one that we could get an indictment from the grand jury and could try, but it wasn't what you'd call a slam dunk. Meanwhile, Darlene was trying to pick up the pieces and move on with her life. She decided she could no longer live in the house where her husband Keith had been murdered. 
she got in touch with a home builder named Robert Pavelka. She wanted to know if, if uh, I had a house for sale. And I told her I had just sold a house. And she said, well, she looked at one out in the basic vicinity that uh, how much would it I charge her to uh, do some demolition, take the house out for the lot. I said, well, if you're looking, if you're looking for a lot, because the house was fairly new, you know, it was built in the 80s. So there was a lot of money to spend on a, on it just to tear it down. I said, I, I have some uh, lots for sale. Pelvelka gave Darlene directions to a piece of secluded land next to a pond. A few hours later, she got back in touch with him. She called me back and uh, said, does a pond come with the land? And, and I told her, yes, it does. And she said, well, that's great because Keith always wanted a, a pond for his kids to go fishing in. And that's what I told him. I said, that is something that at one time Keith would have loved to have had. Pavelka says Darlene was so excited about the pond, he wasn't surprised when she called to say she was going to buy the property. A few weeks later, she met up with him to sign the paperwork. At the end of the deal, she said, uh, well, you can cover that, that pond up now. And I kind of looked at her strange because that was why she really wanted the land. Darlene has her own story. She says she and her mother had discussed the safety of the pond, and with three young boys, she decided to fill it in. Mom told me, she said, well, she said, you may, you know, think real hard about covering this up. She said, so you don't have to worry about the kids at the young, you know, their young age. Pavelka knew that Darlene had been arrested for her husband's murder. And something about her sudden reversal about wanting the pond filled in didn't feel right to him. For two weeks, you know, it really bothered me. I said, you know, why, well, she wants the land for the pond and now she wants me to cover it up. So I called a friend of mine. Pavelka's friend worked in the county sheriff's office. He put him in touch with Texas Ranger Steve Foster. The first thought that I thought was, she has thrown the 22 pistol in the tank. It was just a hunch. But Foster was a seasoned investigator, and to him, Pavelka's story added up to just one thing. Darlene had gotten rid of the murder weapon in the pond, and now wanted to cover it up. He called Lieutenant Tracy O'Connor. As soon as he told me about the pond location, I immediately thought, I said, you know, I bet you that gun's there. He said, that's what I'm thinking. They called in a state police dive team. Two of them uh, suited up, began to search the, the pond to see if they could find a weapon. Fifteen minutes into getting into the water, one of them said, I've got something. And sure enough, he pulled up a 22 pistol. The pistol matched the description of the gun missing from the Gentry home. Police believed they had found the murder weapon. That was a key piece of evidence that we really needed, was that gun. But what good would the gun be in proving their case if they couldn't link it directly to Darlene? Investigators devised a scheme to do just that. We went about trying to figure out a plan as to get her involved more because we knew that she could say, you know, it's not me, somebody else put it there. We wanted to seal the deal with her. They turned to Robert Pavelka for help. We talked about it, how could we get her back out there? And I said, well, the, the, the pond has to be pumped to either push it in or to clean it out. Either way, the water's got to go. Pavelka called Darlene to set the bait. He told her he needed to drain the pond before filling it. Investigators figured it wouldn't be long before Darlene would show up at the pond to retrieve the gun. And if she did, they'd be ready for her. The idea that we finally came up with was we'll sit there and watch the pond but let's get a video camera and set it up. Foster waited in his car up on the roadway while his partner hid a video camera in the woods. The trap was set and the waiting began. We sat out there overnight in the dark thinking that she would come during the middle of the night and she didn't. Night turned to day. No Darlene. Pavelka made another call and told Darlene he wouldn't be able to drain the pond until the following day. 
The vigil continued for several hours. And then, there it was. Foster spotted Darlene's SUV. I'm watching her pull up in her SUV. Uh, she gets out and uh, I see her walk off into the woods toward the pond. I couldn't get on the telephone fast enough. I said, start the camera and get out of there. Foster's partner scrambled to action and was able to clear out just before Darlene arrived. The sting was playing out exactly as planned. Here was Darlene Gentry, caught on camera, wearing boots, wading into the water. She walks around, walks into the ponds, has a probe of some sort and begins sticking, looking for, looking for the gun. It was clearly her in the water, looking for that weapon in the exact spot where those divers had found it. Darlene spent almost 20 minutes at the pond before leaving. Unbeknownst to her, we had already found the gun and it was already in DPS Austin being analyzed to, to make sure it was the murder weapon. You almost wish you were in the wood with the gun and walking out and say, hey, you're looking for this. When the prosecutors saw the sting operation video, they thought they had the last piece of the puzzle. But they were also concerned that identifying Darlene on camera might be a problem. The first question was brought out was, are we sure that's Darlene Gentry? I said, it's Darlene Gentry. I checked the vehicle, it, it's Darlene. I mean, there's not very many long blondes going to be out in the woods walking around in a pond probing for a pistol. That was enough to satisfy prosecutors. They were ready to go to trial. When we had that evidence, that really tied the knot on it. And uh, what was a circumstantial case where the defense could perhaps make some certain arguments became much less so. And there was another piece of important evidence also secured. The crime lab reported that the shell casing found inside the latex glove was fired from the weapon found in the pond. Armed with the new evidence, prosecutors were able to indict Darlene for the murder of her husband Keith. The trial began on February 6, 2007. Prosecutors knew the former beauty queen and mother of three might be a sympathetic figure for the jury, but they were convinced they had more than enough evidence for a conviction. The evidence in this case is going to show to you the defendant, Darlene Gentry, sitting here in this courtroom next to her attorneys, is guilty of the offense of murder. Prosecutors told jurors that Darlene killed her husband and then tried to make it look like an intruder had done it. They said even the 911 call was part of an effort to throw investigators off her trail. They played it in court. I got up this morning, I was in my son's room because they didn't sleep. My back door was open, my husband's guns are all gone, and um, I just had to get up and get in the bathroom. There's nobody that comes in and finds their husband shot and calls 911 and goes into a long labored account about how the house has been broken into and what's missing and then gets to kind of an, oh, by the way, my husband's here with a gunshot in his head. That's just not the way people act. Prosecutors presented the physical evidence against Darlene. The shell casing, the glove, the DNA, the fact that the guns were piled out uh, in the yard stacked there, the fact that her fingerprints were on one of them. Then jurors got to see the prosecution's smoking gun. The video showing Darlene allegedly looking for the murder weapon in the exact spot where police had found it. I know the jury watched the uh, video very intently and you could see it made a big impression on them. With the video fresh in the jurors' minds, the prosecution rested. Darlene had always denied killing her husband, and now she was prepared to give her side of things. She says the prosecution's theory that she didn't care about Keith was a lie. I loved him. He's the father of my children. I wouldn't have wanted anything to happen to him. So, you know, as I said, everybody perceives everybody's actions differently, and that is the way they're perceiving it because that's the answer to their case that they want closed. Darlene says she has no idea how the murder weapon ended up in Robert Pavelka's pond. 
She maintains she didn't put it there, and she doesn't care that police believe she did. Good for them, but there we go again. Prove that. I know I didn't put it there. They don't know who put it there. According to Darlene, she went to the pond that day because she heard rumors that police believed the gun might be there. She says Robert Pavelka told her he would meet her there. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe if I go out here and, you know, meet him and we find this, then I'll have somebody that's there with me that can see, look, here, here is this and we can get it to somebody. But when she got there, Pavelka was nowhere to be found. Darlene was alone, yet continued looking for the gun. She now admits that was pretty stupid. It was one of those things, as I'm even doing this, I am thought, what am I doing? Why am I even here? Darlene insists Robert Pavelka set her up. But Pavelka denies ever telling Darlene he was going to meet her at the pond. He says all he did was call and tell her the pond would be drained and everything else she did on her own. Darlene believes police used Robert Pavelka to illegally set her up and that the entire case against her was built on police and prosecutorial misconduct. You have um, Pavelka sitting up on the stand saying that the phone conversations between him and I were recorded. The Texas Ranger gets up there and says there was no recording ever made. So, you know, there's all this that's going on that no one even has a clue what the true truth of it all is because how could you because you have these people up on the stand one saying one one saying the other and the judge is allowing it as for false evidence Darlene says look no further than the testimony of detective Noel about the 22 caliber shell casing found inside the latex glove Noel says everything else was checked here conveniently is this trash can that nobody wanted to go into but he did and he finds this glove he says he finds the glove hands it to one of the experts that's there on the scene they're the ones that find the casing well there's no picture of it actually being in the trash nobody was around when he found this in fact there were crime scene photos taken of all the evidence found at Darlene's house except the glove and shell casing but why would police and prosecutors want to frame her Darlene says it's simple they wanted a conviction and made up their minds early that she was the killer regardless of what they have found and what they saw they were dead set that I was guilty that I did it and that was the end of subject Darlene says the proof is in the dashboard camera video taken less than seven minutes after police arrive at her house something stinks about this Gary I think she did it something ain't right here man I'm telling you and now the time had come for Darlene to make her case the courtroom was filled with tension in anticipation of a vigorous defense but no one would get a chance to hear it I had asked several times let me just get up there and he kept no I don't think you need to do that because regardless that you get up there they're just going to twist everything you have to say to the surprise of the jury and even Darlene the defense rested its case without calling one single witness all of a sudden he just says we rest so that was like a total what are you doing why he didn't put anybody up I have no idea it was like are you kidding me because the way he was speaking I was like this is not what I was expecting he would stutter and just it was a joke I have no idea what he was in his mind, where he thought he was going with all of this and why he chose to do this. It took the jury only five hours to come back with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant Darlene Gentry guilty of the offense of murder as alleged in the indictment. Darlene Gentry was sentenced to 60 years in prison for murdering her husband. Darlene says she was numb when the guilty verdict came down. Honestly, I can't even tell you. I was in such a a shock throughout the whole thing. It, it was just, it was a circus, the whole thing. For the Gentries, who had sat front row the entire trial, it was a bittersweet moment. Sad but happy. 
sad for her you know, because you know, it's proven that you killed him. You know, that's proven. But happy that that trial is over with. After her trial, Darlene immediately filed an appeal. She claimed the key evidence, the video of her at the pond, should never have been seen by the jury because the entire sting operation was a case of illegal entrapment. I know on the way out there, in my heart, I kept thinking, what am I doing? Why am I going out here to meet him? You know, just kept thinking, kept thinking that. And I should have, ne I should have listened to, you know, my, my heart telling me that because I wouldn't be sitting here right now. A judge ruled against her. The conviction would stand. Then, in February 2010, Darlene challenged her conviction, citing 15 grounds of official misconduct. An appellate court is now reviewing her case. I don't know how all this is going to play out because there are so many, you know, I had faith in the system until I got into the system. And um, I don't know how it's all going to really work because there's so many legalities of everything that has to be done just right. Police and prosecutors forcefully deny all of Darlene's accusations. We believe that things like the evidence being planted are absolutely bogus. If there's a hearing required, we'll be certainly glad to uh, participate in it. I've consulted with the DA's office. Uh, it's just preposterous. I mean, she's entitled to it by, you know, our U.S. Constitution. But in the same sense, uh, I believe it's just ridiculous some of the accusations of the uh, writ of habeas corpus. I, I'm not an attorney. You know, I'm an investigator and our job is to investigate things to the, the best we can and be as thorough as we can. I didn't kill my husband. I love my children and I love my family. As for the Gentries, Darlene's appeals have been a constant reminder of their painful loss. It's hard on me because I was so ignorant at the time it happened. Because we lost a son and we lost a daughter. Darlene says she understands why the Gentries, especially Glenda, feels that she's responsible for Keith's murder. She wants an ending to this. And I can't blame her because she wants to blame somebody. And I'm that person she's blaming right now because I don't know what I would do if I was in her shoes because that was her son. But she's forgetting that was my husband as well. While Darlene serves her sentence, her in-laws are raising her three sons. I think she's, uh, she has really missed out on an enjoyable little life with three boys. They are precious. They are good kids. They take after their daddy. I hope she knows that. The boys have no direct contact with their mother. Thanks for watching.